John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe me? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let me pray one more time. <clears throat> God, with one voice, we pray, come thou fount of every blessing and tune our hearts and our minds to see and to savor your amazing grace. We know that because you are in control of all things that nobody is here by accident. Every single one of us is here by divine appointment, and that means that you have something very specific to say to each and every one of us. So I pray that you would say it. Say it loudly, say it clearly, say it compellingly. I pray that you would overpower our unbelief, that you would speak into our doubts, that you would overcome our fears, that ultimately you would help us to see Jesus. It is your voice, O oh God, that we need to hear this morning. It is your truth that alone can set us free. So I pray this morning that you, O oh God, would preach. Preach to all of us, me included. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's a strange question, one that we read right past, typically, if we're reading that passage. I know for years I read right past it, didn't think anything of it. Strange question, but even stranger than that is that I would choose this passage to preach from on Easter Sunday. I mean, there's no direct reference to the resurrection here. Uh, this isn't about the empty tomb, per se. At least it's not the passage that talks about the empty tomb. But this passage... And specifically, this question gets at the heart of who Jesus is and what Easter is all about. If you talk to different Bible scholars about what Nathaniel meant when he asked the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth, you'll hear them say one of two things. Um, some say Nathaniel is referring to the cultural and geographical insignificance of Nazareth. Can anything good come from such a small, insignificant place like that? Galilee was remote, and within the remote area of Galilee itself, Nazareth barely registers. In fact, it receives no mention from Jewish sources before the third century. It was a village of no more than 500 people at the most in the days when Jesus grew up there. It's about 16 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee, which means it's not near the Mediterranean Sea and would not have been on a lot of travel routes. Uh, so if you were born there, you lived there, and you basically never left there. It was, it was a place out in the sticks, really. An insignificant place. Nazareth, Nazareth was in the backwoods. And in the eyes of more educated and urban Jews, Nazarenes would have been ignorant and irrelevant people. Um, they would have been uneducated. No one of distinction lived there. And no one of importance came from there. So some Bible scholars suggest that the reason Nathaniel asks the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip just told him that we've, we've encountered the one that the law and the prophets told us about. The one that God promised long ago. We met him. He's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel's like, oh, time out. 
Can anything good? Nazareth, are we talking about the same place? Nazareth, really? I mean, if you were... If you were looking for the Messiah, go to Jerusalem, the place of sophistication and cultural importance. That's where all the movers and shakers were. That's where all the important people came from. That's where all the influencers were. To Nathaniel, it was unlikely that the promised Messiah would come from a place like Nazareth. It was dirty. It was insignificant. It was irrelevant. Other Bible scholars say that Nathaniel asked his question because Nazareth had a reputation for sinfulness and immorality, which is why he used the word good, implying that whatever came from Nazareth was not good in a moral sense. That Nazareth was a place where immorality and sinfulness reigned supreme, and so there's no way that the Son of God would come from a place like that, would come from a dirty, sinful, vile place like that. But if the first interpretation means, can anything great come out of a place so small, the second interpretation would mean, can anything good come out of a place so bad? Now, regardless of which one you think it is, I don't know, and honestly, I don't really care, but regardless of which interpretation is correct, both make a very strong point that Jesus shattered all preconceived notions of the kind of place God's son would come from totally shattered it. He came from a small place, a sinful place, an insignificant place, a a dirty place, a, a place that had no good reputation whatsoever. It wasn't a place that was spurning out intellectuals and cultural elite. It certainly wasn't a place that you would think to find God's son, the one that had been promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised that he would send a rescuer to clean up the mess we made when he said, one day the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. That's the first time in the Bible that God announces a rescue plan. That we made this incredible mess, but God was committed to cleaning up the mess that we made. So if Easter tells us anything at all, it tells us that God's capacity to clean things up is infinitely greater than our capacity to mess things up. And so regardless of which interpretation you may go with, the fact of the matter is Jesus shattered, as I said, all preconceived notions of where the Son of God might come from. But back to the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Believe it or not, Nathaniel's question is the question we all ask. Can light really come out of darkness? Can redemption come out of wreckage? Can good come out of bad? Is it possible? The question for us may be this, can anything good come out of my failure? Can anything good come out of teenage rebellion or divorce or my struggle with addiction? Can anything good come out of adultery? Can anything good come out of losing my job? Can anything good come out of being betrayed? Can anything good come out of loneliness or discouragement or loss? Can anything good come out of an emotionally dead marriage or singleness or shattered dreams at all? Can anything good come out of any of that stuff? I don't know what it may be for you, but you get the question. You look at your life or you look at the lives of people around you perhaps, or you look at the circumstances in this world and you think to yourself, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can we hope for anything better than this? Is it even possible that new life could be breathed into this dead place? We tend to think that the only people Uh, that only the people who have a substance abuse problem are the people who need recovery. You know, we talk about people in recovery. We talk about recovery communities, recovery places, and those tend to be places that specialize in helping people deal with uh, substance abuse addictions, uh, drugs, alcohol, maybe sex, whatever the case may be. But we tend to think that there are people like that who are in recovery, and if you're not addicted to some sort of substance that you are not in recovery. But the fact of the matter is that's just it's not true. The truth is we all need recovery. If you are human, you're in recovery, okay? I was telling somebody not long ago that the sanctuary is a recovery place masquerading as a church. 
<laughs> That's really what we are. And the challenge for somebody like me in the leadership of this church is not to deliver grace to the people who know they're in recovery. It's to convince the people who don't think they're in recovery that they are, okay? Um, it's, it's trying to convince people who may look across the room at someone who deals with substance abuse and goes, well, that person's in recovery. Thank God I'm not like them, okay? Um, there's a story about that in the Bible, if you remember, the Pharisee standing in the temple court and uh, the sinner is over in the corner beating his breast and saying, God, forgive me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Pharisee's over here looking at him and praying, also saying, God, thank you that you didn't make me like that guy. <laughs> thank you that I'm better than that guy. Jesus points him out and says, it's the guy beating his breast that walks away justified, not that guy. Um, and so the truth is, we're, we're all in recovery, if your heart has ever been broken, ever, if you've ever been betrayed, if you've ever felt alone, if you've ever felt abandoned, if you've ever felt radically misunderstood, if you've ever felt lost because you can't fix someone you love, or you can't change the course of someone you care about, if you've ever been hurt by anyone ever, if you've ever sinned or been sinned against ever, you're in recovery. And that includes all of us. If there's one thing the Bible makes abundantly clear, it is that we are all broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. So we're all in recovery from something. We all, someone said it to me not long ago, well, six months ago or so now. They said, um, we all have an unhealthy relationship to something, something. Something that we depend on to soothe the pain, to help us regain control of our lives or whatever the case may be. And that means that there are two types of people in this world. People in recovery who admit that they are and people in recovery who think that they're not. But there is no one who is not in recovery. Now, why do I say all of that here? Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's a mid-sermon advertisement for our church, okay? That's what we are. That's who we are. Um, but in, truly, um, because this question, can anything good come out of Nazareth, is only asked by people who are aware of their brokenness and the brokenness around them. And so if you're not aware of your fallenness, uh, your brokenness, or the brokenness and fallenness of the people around you or this world, you'll never ask that question. This question will be meaningless to you. Um, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of wreckage over the years. I mean, I've heard people's stories and sometimes wonder, to be quite honest with you, will this person ever hope again? Is this situation beyond repair? Is this person so far gone that there's no coming back? I mean, honestly, I, I've heard some stories over the years, and I think to myself, I don't say this out loud, but I think to myself, this is a mess that will never be cleaned up. Like, this situation is too far gone. This person is too far gone. Um, there's, no, there's no hope here whatsoever. But more closely to home, I not just wrestle with other people's stories, I wrestle with my own story. I've talked about this a lot, but six years ago, my life fell apart. I was hopeless, and I was convinced I would never be happy again. I would never enjoy life again. I was sure life was over. The loss, the guilt, the shame, the depression, it sapped my energy. It suffocated my excitement, and I found myself during that season wondering over and over again, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, I I was keenly aware of the fact that I was in a dark place and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And I found myself maybe not asking this question specifically, but essentially asking the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there any hope for me? Is there any hope for the rest of my life? Will I ever be happy again? Will I hope again? Will I enjoy life again? Will things ever get better than they are right now? I mean, do you ever feel like that, ever? Do you feel like that now? Do you look at yourself and your life or the life of someone you love and wonder, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Ever, is this, 
Is my daughter ever going to come home? Is my son ever going to call? Is my wife ever going to forgive me? I mean, is, is my husband ever going to love me? Uh, will I ever not constantly feel critiqued by this person? I mean, you could, the list goes on and on and on. If every single one of you came up here for two minutes each, you could share something about your life or the life of someone you love that may seem somewhat hopeless. Will my marriage ever get better? Um, will, will my boss ever treat me with dignity? <laughs> um, I think I've told you this story before about the guy who went to the doctor for tests. He was feeling kind of sick, and he went to the doctor to get some tests. And the doctor said, I'll, I'll call you in a week with your test results. And a week went by, and the doctor didn't call. And on the eighth day, the doctor called, and the guy answered the phone. And the doctor said, Joe, <clears throat> I hate to say this, but I've got bad news for you, and I've got really bad news for you. And the guy's like, are you kidding me? Bad news and really bad news. He said, you know what, doc? Let me down easily. Give me the bad news first. He said, the bad news is you have 24 hours to live. He's like, well, that's the bad news. That's the bad news. What's the really bad news? He says, the really bad news is that I was supposed to call you yesterday. <laughs> I mean, you ever, <laughs> you know, before the, before the call's even over, Joe keels over. Um, I mean, doesn't life sometimes feel like there is only bad news and really bad news? Um, I mean, life is hard. Pain is real. This, isn't, this is not a joke. I mean, Henry Durbinville once said that we've been promised a safe arrival, but not a smooth journey. The waters are rough. It's hard. Um, I realized this a couple years ago. I was driving in my car, and I've always been one that has loved life, the sights, sounds, smells of life. I've always been an extroverted person, a people person. I've just, I've always really enjoyed life. I mean, it hasn't always been easy, but I've always really enjoyed it. And uh, during a season when I was not enjoying it, I thought to myself, I remember exactly where I was driving my car, and I thought, you know, life is more hard than easy. It's, it's just, it's painful. It's painful. With each season, I, I talked about this last week uh, when I concluded the series Unmasked Through the Ten Commandments. I talked about how each season that we go through, um, there's a sense of death, a sense of loss when we leave that season. I talked about my own kids and how it's hard for me to even walk past a picture of them in my house when they were much smaller and not burst into tears because I miss that season. I miss that time in their life. I, I miss it. Uh, I mean, life really is just a, a series of lots and lots of deaths. It's hard. Pain is real. Sometimes life does feel like there's only bad news and really bad news. Well, Nathaniel asks the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I love Philip's answer. He just says, come and see. Come and see. Nathaniel goes with Philip, sees Jesus, and Jesus proceeds to blow his mind. I mean, just... I saw you. You saw me. How did I know you? What he could have said is, I formed you in your mother's womb. I've known you from before the foundation of the earth. I brought you into existence, Nathaniel, for this very moment. That's what he could have said. But he didn't. He didn't want to blow his mind that quickly, that early. So he said, I saw you by the fig tree. <laughs> but he could have said a lot more. The Bible does say a lot more about all of us. Um, and Jesus says, I mean, Nathaniel says, oh, no, okay, well, given the fact that you clearly saw me from far away and you know me, you must be the son of God. And Jesus goes, that's why you think I'm the son of God? Because I said I saw you by the fig tree? 
Oh, Nathaniel, just wait, man. <laughs> You're going to see things that are going to blow your mind. I am going to show you things. I am going to bring life out of death. I am going to bring hope out of hopelessness. I am going to bring things to be that you can't even imagine. You're going to see things and experience things that you didn't think were even possible. Just stick with me. I got this. He blows his mind. Well, when you're feeling hopeless and scared and discouraged and broken and frustrated and fallen, turning to yourself will bring you no hope, no rescue, no relief. See, this is what, this is what we tend to, do, tend to do. Rather than come and see when we're feeling at the end of our rope, look, looking away from ourselves to someone else, to Jesus specifically, uh, we turn into ourselves. We too often think that our greatest problems are outside of us and the greatest solution resides inside of us. If I can just get serious and pull myself up by my bootstraps and focus, I can get myself out of this mess. Well, the Bible tells the exact opposite scenario. It says our greatest problem is inside of us and the only solution is outside of us. And so what happens is too often our counsel to ourselves and to other people, quite frankly, is the equivalent of giving a drowning man swimming lessons. Paddle harder, kick faster. We assume we possess the internal power to get things right. So we turn into ourselves thinking that in and of ourselves, we can resurrect this situation or resurrect this person or resurrect ourselves. See, the world and the church wants to avoid Nazareth at all costs. They tell the brokenhearted to move on, just move on. They tell the addict, just stop it. Don't you realize how destructive this is? Just quit. They tell the sorrowful to brighten up. They tell those in a slump to snap out of it. I mean, the world and the church, sadly, say that nothing good can come from a place of weakness and brokenness and failure. So you have to escape these places by doing more, trying harder, getting better, and so on and so forth. The message is you are the only one that can be the solution to your greatest problem. Um, but as too many people already know, this never works, ever. Ever. You can try to convince yourself that it works. It doesn't work. I mean, have you ever tried to will yourself out of a depression? Ever? I mean, how has that worked? Have you ever tried to talk yourself out of your insecurities? You know, like Stuart Smalley on Saturday Night Live, pathetic man staring into the mirror saying to himself, I'm good enough, I'm strong enough, and doggone it, people like me. Don't you remember that? Okay, we, that, I mean, metaphorically speaking, we do that all the time. It doesn't work. Have you ever tried to comfort yourself out of loneliness? The only answer to the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth, is simply come and see. That's it. Come and see the resurrection and the life. Come and see the one who has conquered sin and death and promises, promises to never leave you, to never forsake you, that there is nothing, nothing you can do that will ever tempt God to blink or bail, ever. Come and see the one who alone can bring light where there is only darkness, hope where there is only despair, beauty where there is only ashes, life where there is only death. Come and see the one who has removed our guilt and swallowed our shame and forgiven our sins. Come and see that one. Come and see the one who knows everything there is to know about you and yet loves you with an unwavering, unending Never let you go kind of love. I've said this before, and if you've been here at all, you've heard me say it, um, that if the whole world knew everything about you that God knows, you would seclude yourself. You would go into solitary confinement willingly, okay? I'll take it a step further. <laughs> if the person sitting next to you knew everything about you, 
that God knows, they would get up, leave, and never come back. Okay? And you would be tempted to call 911. I mean, that's just, it's the truth. I mean, it's the truth. If, if the people in our lives knew everything about it, in fact, I used to say uh, when I was the pastor of a different church, I used to say, um, if you guys knew everything about me that God knows, you would never come here, ever. And if I knew everything about you that God knows, I would never let you walk through the door, ever, okay? So to say that God knows you and loves you with a never give you up kind of love is astounding. He knows things about you that you don't even know about you. He knows those dark places that you are that you're unaware of inside of you. Um, come and see the one who knows everything there is to know about you, and yet instead of running away, he loves you with an un infallible, unending, unwavering, non-blinking, never let you go kind of love. Come see that one. So the world and the church may say that nothing good can come out of Nazareth, but God says, it's in our weakness that you discover my strength. It's in, it's in your failure that you discover my faithfulness. It's in your guilt that you discover my grace. Here's some good news for you. God, what are the kinds of things that God breathes life into? Dead things. That's it. God resurrects dead things. He only brings dead things to life. If you feel dead, if the situation in your life seems dead, if someone that you love is dead in a metaphorical sense, it's not hopeless. Deadness is the only thing God works with. It's the only thing God works with. Hopelessness is God's cup of tea. I mean, that's the stuff he works with. Hopelessness, deadness, weakness, failure. These are all of the ingredients that God uses. God only uses dead, failing, weak people because dead, failing, weak people are all that there are. God only brings dead things to life. And that means that our sin and our pain and our brokenness and our hopelessness and our loneliness is God's hometown, Nazareth. I mean, that's, that, that's his stuff, man. That, those are his people, okay? So can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there any hope? Well, I say to you, not just on this Easter Sunday morning, but every Sunday Come and see Jesus. It's the only thing I can tell you. I had a friend once say that someone came up to him and asked him, you're the preacher, right? He said, yes. He goes, so you're the guy with all the answers. He said, no, I'm the guy who points to the guy with all the answers. <laughs> I resonate with that. Um, I, I, I don't, it's not, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can any hope be breathed into this hopeless situation? Or can any Life be breathed into the deadness of my existence? My answer is not, well, I've got some wisdom to share with you on Sunday morning. Or if you come to church, you'll meet some really nice people. Or hopefully we'll sing a song that lifts your spirits. No. No, 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 no. None of that stuff will do. These are all means to an end. It's simply come and see Jesus. And we hope that through song and sermon and fellowship with one another, and if through all of our messiness and fallibility, that Jesus will communicate himself to us and through us to one another. That's our hope. But the, the goal, make no mistake about it, is come and see Jesus. And this is what Jesus says to you this morning. Let me take that burden from you, whatever it is. Give that to me. Let me carry it. I'm big enough. I'm wide enough. I am the father who longs for every one of his children. I am the friend, the only friend who will never leave you. 
I remember having a conversation with one of my sons. They're both here this morning, by the way. But I remember having a conversation with one of my sons, and we were talking about God and reasons why I believe in God. And we were talking through some of the philosophical issues regarding the existence of God and whatnot. And I said, listen, I mean, we can talk about uh, the philosophical arguments or the evidential arguments for the existence of God. We can talk about that. But let me tell you first and foremost why I believe in God. He's the best friend I have. He's the one person who has never let me down, has never blinked, has never bailed, who has never been like, oh, oh, well, hold on a minute. Ever. He's the best friend you will ever have. He's the friend who will never leave you. He is the light behind the darkness. He is the shining that your shame cannot extinguish. He is the door where you thought there was only a wall. He is what comes after deserving. And he says to you, I am gift without cost. I am gift, pure, unadulterated gift for you. So make no mistake, Jesus is not an idea, okay? He's a person, a person who invites weary, burdened, broken, guilty, failing people to find love and life, forgiveness and a future, grace and mercy, hope and rest. Come to me, all who labor and are burdened, what does Jesus say? And I will give you rest. He doesn't say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you some divine counsel on how to fix yourself. He doesn't say that. I'll give you some instructions on what you need to do in order to get everything right. It's not what he says. He says, come to me if you're weary, if you're burdened, if you're scared, if you're insecure, if you're lonely, if you're tired of trying to make it on your own, come to me. I'll give you rest. We live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. Possibly, probably, my favorite verse in all the Bible is Romans 8.1. In Romans 8.1, in fact... um, James Montgomery Boyce, who was a Presbyterian minister at the historic 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for many, many years, died in the fall of 2000, um, wrote a ton of books, but he was well known for saying that Romans 8.1 is not just the thesis of Romans 8, and it's not just the thesis of the book of Romans, it's the thesis of the entire Bible, that the entire Bible. Bible revolves around Romans 8.1, where Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. He doesn't say, Paul doesn't say, think how it would be if there were no condemnation. He says, there is therefore now none. So while you may hold your sins against you, And while others may hold your sins against you, God doesn't hold your sins against you because because God held your sins against Jesus, okay? So he's making in Romans 8, 1, Paul's making an unconditional statement, not a conditional one. He's not saying, if you do this, that, and the other, I won't condemn you. Remember the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8? The order there is very important. Pharisees drag her out and say, Jesus, what would you do? The law says you have to stone her. They were always trying to accuse him of sweeping God's standards under the rug, lowering the bar of God's standards. And Jesus responded and simply said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Like the the, the issue is not that her adultery is unimportant, the issue is that you, you guys think you're not guilty of it. <laughs> That's the issue. The issue is not that she is guilty. The issue is that you think you're not. So you who have the stone, you who are without sin, you cast the first stone. Well, they, of course, they all left. And what did Jesus say to her? Woman, where are your accusers? 
And she looks around and says, they've, they've bailed. And he says, then neither do I condemn you, statement number one, go and sin no more. Okay? He doesn't say, go and sin no more, and if you can just stay out of another man's bed for freaking six months, then I won't condemn you. He doesn't say that. He says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. It's an unconditional statement. Paul's saying the same thing right here. Unconditional. It's not a conditional one. He's making a flat-out assertion. Robert Capon, who is my, probably my favorite author of all time, puts it like this, commenting on Romans 8.1. Paul did not say, God has done this and that and the other thing, and if you can manage to pull it all together, you may be able to experience a little solace in the prison of your days. No. He has simply said, you are free. Your services are no longer required. The salt mine has been closed. You have fallen under the ultimate statute of limitation. You are out from under everything. Shame, guilt, blame. Full stop. Why? Because God only brings dead people to life. That's it. And what does the Apostle Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2? And you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. You know when you came into this world, we all celebrate the life of new babies. You know they come into this world in one sense alive and in another sense very much dead. I mean, that's the Bible's diagnosis. That's not mine. Dead. Spiritually dead. And so Paul says, you who from infancy were born dead in your trespasses and sins, God in Christ made you alive. Jesus is not the only one that God raised from the dead. He's not. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but it's the resurrection of Jesus that gives us any hope and promise of our own resurrection. Um, the resurrection is the Father's Amen to the sons, it is finished. Friday, Good Friday, Jesus, it is finished, bows his head. Easter Sunday morning, empty tomb, it's the Father going, Amen. Done deal. Easter celebrates the fact that because Jesus conquered death, you and I have been sprung with no probation officer to report to. None, okay? Now, some of you know what it's like to report to a probation officer, okay? I, for one, know what it's like to report to a probation officer, um, which is probably why that image came to mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been a long time. It's not like two years ago, okay? We're talking like 17, 18 years old, all right? So don't... It's funny. I had a professor in seminary say, if you're going to preach... Confess, I think it's important to confess your sins, but never confess sins that aren't older than five years ago or else you'll lose your job. <laughs> I said, there's, sadly, that tends to be true. Um, we feel the freedom to confess past sins. It's present sins that we have a difficulty confessing. Um, but let me close with this. Easter is the celebration that resurrection follows death. I don't know what situation you may be in, how you may feel about yourself or someone that you love and care about, and how hopeless it may appear to be. The fact that on this morning we celebrate resurrection, which only follows death, should give us some hope. And you know, let me say this, because I don't want to be misunderstood. Nowhere does the Bible say that God will rescue us from all of our trials and tribulations and difficulties in this life. Nowhere. Nowhere. Um, what he does promise is that he will be with us in our trials and tribulations. He says, yea, I will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say, uh, because you're mine, you don't have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You will walk through it, but I will be with you. 
I will be with you. I will never leave your side no matter how hard it gets. So Easter is the celebration that resurrection follows death, that light overcomes the darkness, and that the best thing that could have ever happened to bad people came out of Nazareth. Let's pray together.